Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today, we're going across the sea to Taipei, Taiwan, to talk with J.K. Lin. J.K. is an international intellectual property law attorney. He is a director of the Taiwan International Patent and Law Office, or TIPLO for short. And he, I've known him for several years. Uh, I've asked him to talk to us because Taiwan has been in the news a lot lately. But I wanted to get a personal view of somebody who's there to talk about current events. And JK is an experienced and knowledgeable Taiwan attorney who knows what's happening on the ground in. Taiwan. So, JK, I want to welcome you to our program. And how are you? Thank you, Mr. Um, Schlav. Hi, we, we, you know, you just look um, so 20 years younger than you. <laughs> so I just totally um, like making a new friends. But thank you so much for having me. And, you know, um, it was a pretty I'm hasty um, condition that I got your email because I was expecting my wife to come back from, she's Japanese and she was scheduled to come back from uh, in Tokyo. And then amidst the missiles, amidst the Chinese, the barbarians <laughs> drill, I was really, she just post, uh, postponed her flights for twice, just in order to, yeah, be on the safe well, side. So eventually, that, you know, that, that, that's yeah. what I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about current events and uh, tell us a little bit of background about Taiwan and and how we how you you know Taiwan got to where it is and what's happening now. Remarkable. Um, so as I suggested, I'm going to have some um, kind of opening remark. The first thing is that um, all these things, you know, not only in Taiwan but nowadays we have the um, Western something happened in Black Sea coast. And in the West of Pacific, um, in the Pacific region, we have a oh, looming crisis here and already, you know, invasion happening there. Um, our observation is that we're about time to really settle down this um, euphoria, the thinking that we already have a new order since about, you know, the 1990s. But, you know, that was shortly after the Tiananmen, but then the Berlin walls fell, but somehow the US world. Um, we're intoxicated with this euphoria, thinking that a new order. And so China and Russia were welcome to join. And then later on, but by then, Taiwan was a victim because, you know, it was um, by the assertion of China, um, it insists that Taiwan needed to be disposed of. And it was so scary because in a lot of, uh, for about more than 20 years, Taiwan was labeled even by some very um, prominent American top you know presidents as troublemakers <laughs> but even during among the kind of currents Li Tianhui president who was elected by the first direct election in Taiwan in 1996 first direct election went was invited and was given permission to give speech in Cornell University and that displayed how much support from the congressional and from the general politician level we had from the United States. So, and the second thing, but um, all things considered, we still have those, you know, the seed of the um, upheaval for the current day, already sowed during that, those years. And second thing is that we're zoom, zooming back to Taiwan, um, the persecution from the Chiang Kai-shek you know, a lot of people didn't know that the regime was not kind to of the local people when they came, escaped from um, China um, in exile. They somehow occupied the town without legitimacy because, you know, the um, San Francisco um, Treaty just um, was for Japan to renounce all the sovereignty of Taiwan, but not to hand it over to any specific party. Yet, um, the Chiang Kai-shek in that the chaos of losing China to the communists uh, settled down to Taiwan and a lot of persecutions happened. And even though some Taiwanese intellects were like Dr. Chen Peng Mimin, who passed away two months ago, and yesterday we had a big ceremony and, and President um, Tsai went to the ceremony to justify and also to um, give him a 
a, um, a, a trophy to confirm his independence and self-determination um, notion that he has been living for. You know, he, he died at 99 years old, but his whole life was for this very um, important um, cause for the independence and for sovereignty, for permanent, for sustainable prosperity of Taiwan. And he died, and, and but luckily um, the current Taiwanese government top, from top of the president respected the mentor instead of avoiding that. You know, other, if KMT's president is ruling today, he would just totally ignore the event. He would just distance from him. But nowadays, we are highly aware that we have to be tough and really just speak up and saying to the world that Taiwan needs a status in the world so that we can keep our security and also maintain the stability of the Indo-Pacific region and also benefit the whole world. And the third one is the fast evolving Taiwan connected to the free civilized world. Um, this overlaps with what I had said. What is happening in Taiwan is only a little aspect, maybe, but it connect with Zoom into Taiwan. But in fact, it is only a, uh, a, a, a drama in this whole big theater um, of the world revolution. And But finally, among this, what we emphasize that for Taiwan to have um, been able to develop to the current status that we have high tech, we have good society, we have universal um, affordable medical care, we have very loving society and good people relationship and a transparent democracy. That they, these are the major reasons the Taiwanese are winning the respect and love from the whole world. But another important thing common Taiwanese know is that without the alliance, led by the United States of America, Nancy Pelosi's C40 arriving. But, you know, people, thousands of people are on the ground and tracking her flight for hours. No one would be certain um, that she would just show up. Well, well, that well was let's, the, that was, let's, let's yeah. talk about so, Nancy Pelosi. But I hear you then, saying, it, I hear right. you say that, that Taiwan has been going through a lot of changes over the years. And you're in a good, I mean, you're in a position now that you want to maintain it. Nancy Pelosi came to Taiwan, and how? Uh, and and th there's a photo of her. Uh, how how was she received, and what did the Taiwanese people think of of her? Um, you know, Taiwanese people wish to just give her a bear hug, <laughs> all of us. However, you know, we don't have the kind of um, relations where just and so whatever, you know, even Pelosi herself needed just package her schedule to be, you know, like on the lim limbo until she really showed up and to, you know, to accompany with some other countries' visitations. But all, everybody, even in retrospect, know that um, Taiwan was a major or even the single most important destination. Because at this moment, Taiwan needs her. And well, you know, on this occasion, really, including me, I've never um, expected or anticipated that she would pay this much attention to Taiwan. And it was a really um, positive surprise. And well, so yeah, people in Taiwan are overwhelmed and overjoyed, but at the same time, they couldn't do as much as they'd like to do. But, you know, you can see. Um, how many people are just expecting her arrival. And that's all I can do. It's like, you know, aliens, um, we're looking on the aliens arrival, <laughs> UFO. We're, we're kind of scared, but we just hope that they can really um, come and say hello to us because we know that it carries a lot of hope and promises. Well, the, and the, but there was also a threat from China. Right. And, no, and no, we don't we don't really care about that because, you know, a lot of people, China has been propagating on that, advertising that if she would ever show up, American carriers would be blown away. And, and, and it has been a entertaining <laughs> materials on the Internet in, in this part of the world. So, no, um, maybe they say it. And now the conspiracy or a, um, these kind of um, analysis experts are now coming up with um, articles saying that Biden is another Fox, 
and he is using this kind of um, Chinese reaction to put Chinese, to allow Chinese military and the regime to enshrine themselves or put the food in the quicksand of their own um, trap. Because as the more they react in a barbarian way, the worse their international image will become. And then eventually it will be um, for the better of the free world. So in other words, what I hear you saying is that yeah. actually their reaction of China uh, rebounded against them and made them look very bad. Uh, but, and, you, and the people in Taiwan uh, were not feeling uh, a tremendous threat. Uh, just, there was just a lot of talk. I mean, it, it, what are the long-term effects of this for, for Taiwan with China? Um, this was like an incident and so suddenly, you know, like an impromptu um, show off of Pelosi's charms <laughs> in this part of the world. But it does really, like you said, it could just um, signify or um, leave a rather long-term effect. And I think they are positive because it um, reinforced and fortified the relation between Taiwan and United States. And the important part is that Pelosi, no matter you know um, what her political spectrum is viewed in America, her presence in Taiwan is a um, solid goal guarantee for the Taiwanese because we know that what she says sounds very, very um, truthful. Um, promising to keep the Taiwan Relations Act. It was established in 1979 uh, and now 43 years. And that single message is enough, is, you know, and it's beyond any money can buy. It's, it, 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 you know, and for this time, we're happy to say that this is not um, the result of any PR um, action or promotion that Taiwanese initiated. It seemed like, um, of course, we must have the government, the diplomatic um, sections must have also put in a lot of efforts. However, Nancy Pelosi and behind her, I would assume that even Mr. Biden, President Biden, would also have, even you would see that the military's opinions would, you know, came out with a little um, anti um, advice against her uh, sudden arrival. But all things summed up. This is a very successful strategy to put China in a bigger magnifying mirror for the world to see, you know, what China is. And for China to fluster somehow in the international arena and knowing that they can really just, you know, and another very vital difference is that when Ukraine um, is suffering from you, um, before the um, true invasion launched by Russia, Mr. Biden was announcing that over and over, but he's not announcing China's invasion on Taiwan. So now we count on what is being said by Mr. Biden, President Biden himself, or well, even the intelligence of the United States. Let yeah. me ask you a little bit more yeah. about the relationship between Taiwan and China. I mean, do, do the citizens of Taiwan believe or identify as Chinese or Taiwanese or both? I mean, what did they, I mean, when I use the word China, do the Taiwanese feel that includes Taiwan or what, what, what and what does the future hold for Taiwan? I mean, it, do you think Taiwan is gonna become part of the PRC, China? Um, that will probably happen only when the human being, um, reached another galaxy, maybe. <laughs> I don't know when that happened, it probably will. But, you know, first of all, Taiwanese people, you know, the reason that um, Taiwan was kept in, almost intact for 8,000 years, you know, Chinese always brag about the length of the history, about you know, more than 6,000 years, but they have never really succeeded in um, colonizing Taiwan until um, maybe 300 years ago, even after the Hollanders had a portion colonies in Taiwan. 
The reason behind that is that Taiwan it used to be populated by um, Aboriginal people, very much related not the northern Micronesia, but the southern Micronesia people. You know these Taiwanese um, Aboriginal people, Micronesian southern Micronesian people, including Filipino people, and those um, Micronesian related to them, and the flatland people, including some of my ancestors. You know my grand grand father, um, I, I just got to check his background up. He doesn't seem to have any um, Chinese character name until he um, was baptized um, in Kaohsiung. And then there were um, some very prominent um, preachers, Christian, um, you know, spreading Christian and taking care of these people. So they, they were also um, Christianized, but at the same time, these flat, um, lands, indigenous people um, were able to mix into the um, immigration society. And that does not truly indicate that immigration outnumber the local people. It's hard to really um, determine it now. But research, biological research, um, since about 90 years has um, reported that the immunity system of the Taiwanese people in general is more similar to the Micronesian people other than the samples taken from China. So, so, so the you, first so, place, so yeah, China, we're not you, saying uh, that um, we, we should stick to ethnicity, but you know, this is um, something to refer to. And the second so thing is that the um, Chiang people coming from with the Chiang Kai-shek, these people, um, are taking their advantage. And nowadays the, the remnants of the KMT are visiting, you know, they're sending a, a, a entourage to visit some of the people in the offices in China miss this military drills. And it raises, you know, um, critical um, bashing in Taiwan. And you can imagine that when they are ruling Taiwan, you know, the level of persecution and it, it was called the white terror. Um, it lasted in 228. There was the first encounter of Taiwanese people um, in the first place trying to negotiate with the officers, but eventually they um, were slaughtered without you know, any remnants. And so these things happened um, for about, and martial law were imposed in Taiwan for 46 years. And wow. all these things happened, but Taiwanese was lucky and brave enough to come up with their own opposition um, groups. And that became the DDP, which is now rolling Taiwan today. And that happened in um, 1985. And two years later from the establishment of PPT, the martial law was lifted and Chiang Kai-shek's son, Chiang Jingguo, was brave and intelligent. He knew that the time, um, and he was trained in, in, in Moscow and also studied in Siberia. And he know the um, evilness and devil is part of that communist. So he insisted there would be no contacts of negotiation because, you know, the um, national part military failed because they trusted the communists for many well, counts. Well, well so, so it sounds like right. the Taiwanese consider themselves independent uh, and, um, and, it, and, it and is, not just part of China. For now, it, it's almost crystal clear there was a um the history that i mentioned was earlier on but later on even after the, the 2000 years um like 2014 there was a sunflower revolution that um event featured thousands of students um taking over the congress house because they knew that the ruling party by then it was kmt it was president Mar try to just clear the house, a package, a very wholesale package, allowing, disposing all these trays and, and, and transactions and, and allowing the Chinese to do whatever they wanted like, like, you know, like sending um, Taiwan to the disposal of China. But, you know, um, and in a, without any deliberation and depriving the chance of discussion in the Congress. So students, took over the Congress and, and occupied in the Congress for about two months. And then of course, avoided the um, legislation 
And that was the event that pretty much uh, revolutionarily set up the level of Taiwanese consciousness. And then people started to notice how these 20 something or 30 something Taiwan independence level is much higher than those older than 40s. You have a lot of um, conservative and a lot of, but this kind of um, um, the philosophical revolution will become contagious. So nowadays you can, and um, polls are showing you that if you have only two choices, Chinese or Taiwanese, 90% of people in Taiwan would say that I'm a Taiwanese. Only less than 3% of people would say that I'm, because nowadays the uh, way the tourists um, behave in Taiwan, that's a small thing. But you know, the way the Chinese bullying Taiwan and all these uh, pandemic lockdowns and starvation to death, all these things are, and, and the Hong Kong's um, persecution. One by one, Taiwanese people, you know, even for those most layout, um, non-concerning political, you know, people not want to do nothing with politics, they started to know that, and already they know that there is hardly anything they can win from um, befriending with China. And a lot of Chinese business so, expatriate in, in, in Taiwan businessmen in China um, ended up, you know, yesterday there was um, reports saying that people spending 20 years and the final thing was to ask someone to send his um, base of ashes, cremated ashes, back to Taiwan. <laughs> that was the last um, relic that he has for the 20 years in state. A lot of this kind of a sad cases. Let, let, me, let, me, let me move on a little bit. Uh, it's good to get your insight from a person in Taiwan because we don't hear very much. Uh, we, we hear news reports, but we don't hear about people actually in Taiwan and where they're coming from and what you know ideas they have. But I want to talk personally a little bit because I knew your father, M.S. Lin, and he was the founder of your law firm, the Taiwan International Patent and Law Office. And uh, you know, you 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 basically took over and followed in his footsteps. And I'd like to put up a photo of your dad, your father, uh, M.S. Lin. Uh, and there it is. Yeah. And I want to know, how does it feel to follow in your father's footsteps uh, in this law firm? Oh, it, um, in the beginning, you know, I was um, almost brought down by some coup <laughs> of, of some rebellious members, you know. And to the extent that the receptionist sitting on the front desk of the office uh, needed to just um, comfort me and saying that, oh, you look so sad. <laughs> I'm so sad for you. <laughs> it, um, it lasted for about a year or so before people settled down. And uh, we're lucky that uh, most of our, um, my father, by the time he passed away, we had about 180 uh, members in the, um, about 20 lawyers and, and 10 patent attorneys and other supporting members. Nowadays, we have about 300 people. And um, so we have, um, Substantially, we have grown up, but um, I'm just so lucky to have a father who has laid down such a good ground and not to mention the sentimental, um, the kind of attachment to him, but there's nothing you could do. And sometimes even um, to the opposite, I would feel that all my liberty and, and, and all these luck is, is, is a gift in exchange of his um, life. You know, sometimes if you have a very, very long living father, well, he could be very loving and very liberal, you know, allowing you to do things. You also witnessed a lot of um, um, old men like to temper with <laughs> younger generations. <laughs> so, yeah. It's well, a, so it's, it so he, he, he set the pace for you. He, he oh. established, he established uh, the office for you and, and where you would go into the future. And, and I, I want to also, I want to put up your law firm's website. Uh, and on that website, you have the words, praying for the whole world for early return of peace and prosperity. And I, I, you know, that's an interesting uh, number of words. What, why did, what prompted you to put them? And what, 
and there, it, it's over a beautiful city too in the, the photo. Uh, what, what, what is behind those words? What do they mean to you and, and who, where, where, where does it come from? Yeah, the, um, I became fascinated with um, taking, you know, with my Sony um, smartphone and taking pictures and let the application um, stitching them up. So um, that panorama picture was, in fact, it com um, composed of more than 30 pictures that I took one by one. And, what, what, you the know, words, what do the words mean for you? The words um, came to my mind when probably during this um, beginning periods of the pandemic. And so that was the, um, I, I, I pretty much have to confide that I am spiritually very much a Christian um, ever since, because I know that I've been redeemed and um, rescued, resurrected <laughs> or truly rescued from from the Death Valley. So I, I, I pray sometimes and, and I told my family that I wouldn't rule out um, the kind of very fanfare praying if I need to, like, you know, suddenly just, you know, carrying a Bible and, and kneeling down in the center of a um, waiting room of a terminal, <laughs> but I haven't done that kind of thing. But I truly pray that, you know, this incident, I know that it was um, initiated um, from China, but somehow for this, pandemic with the inconvenience of a pandemic people would slow down and think about the future you know in a relatively um easier way because they're not they can turn down a lot of um um, um redundant invitations yeah there were you know we don't try to just blame people point uh, finger pointing and and i hope that yeah most of the people can just Think about their future together and just try to work it out. Okay, yeah. now we have about one minute left, and I'd like to tell ask you where where do you see Taiwan going? You got a, you got a minute. Where what is the future? What does the future hold for Taiwan? It is exuberant. Is that a good word? That's do you fine. have a word for it. <laughs> uh, number one is I told you that we have all types of um, high tech industry, and we also have traditional manufacturing capacity capability, medical industry, so and food sufficiency, self-sufficiency, and this society is loving in a democracy, transparency. On the other hand, we're very much geared up to the attack or potential harassment from China. And that was during the 90s, even uh, under the um, supervision or kind of um, critical opinion of the United States. But nowadays they were asking us for a longer or mid-range uh, missiles. We've already come up with 90% of the um, technology um, skills and eventually they were um, made possible. So now we're very well prepared for all types of challenges. So the future of Taiwan, I, you know, if you give me any other place I would go, I would just stick to here. And I'll think about um, China, if they can come up with a, 12 cylinder engine car <laughs> like Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. If they become so savvy like the Europeans and, and so intelligent like the Americans. All right. Well, JK. But I love China. You know, I, I wouldn't like people to mistake that I have any prejudice. You know, we speak, particularly me, I, I, I'm a language mania and I can speak the kind of a Mandarin like the, these officers, you know, the kind of square language and, 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 and um, mess up with them. That's, I, I had love to have the kind of fun, but nowadays the Chinese and the Russian governments are keeping their um, people too harsh. And I hope that we can really have um, more fun with the people so that, yeah, that would be the beginning, the harbinger of a true world peace. Right. Well, well, J.K., I want to thank you very much for being my guest today uh, and, and w waking up early in, in Taiwan to talk with us. Uh, no, I please. No wake. <laughs> See, <laughs> you know, if you wake up a moment ago, your face will be bloated. <laughs> I would <laughs> let people see that. All right, everybody. We've had a nice trip to Taiwan this morning, uh, and we've learned a little bit about what really goes on there, something more than we hear on the nightly news. So thank you very much, J.K. Lin, and we look forward to seeing you again sometime.
Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.